so today is our final session and we will uh, uh, i hope to wrap it up all together uh, so let me just set, share my screen and we begin now huh? Okay, can everyone see my screen now? Okay, great. Okay, so uh, today we begin our final session. I'm uh, entitled Inductive Bible Study. You'll be wondering why it is, but uh, just, just a fancy name, but I'll come back to that in a while. Uh, but we started, you know, the uh, four weeks ago, talking about reading the Bible, how we need to pray, we need to listen, we need to observe, interpret, and then apply uh, the Bible. And, and reading the Bible is not just about you know, uh, getting to know something about God, about something about Jesus, but that we, we may be uh, what the Lord wants us to be and we may do what He wants us to do. Uh, but also, in addition, it's also about changing our hearts so that we may know, that we may really know uh, Jesus and really love Him more every time we read the Bible. Amen? And I trust that different ones of you have started in different ways. Some of you have been following the listening to the Bible, uh, one, chapter, uh, one chapter a day. Uh, now we are in Proverbs. Uh, some of you are doing your own. That's okay. Whatever that you're doing, uh, keep at it. Huh? And then the second session, we talk about how, you know, Bible reading is not just reading it. Huh? We need to learn to dialogue with the Lord. We need to pray. We need to praise Him. We need to thank Him uh, through, through the words that we have read, huh? uh, through the Bible passages that we have read. We also... Uh, need to know what it means to digest the word, huh? to meditate on it, to think through it, to mount through it. You know, sometimes uh, just you may have read the whole passage, a whole whole chapter, but sometimes just one uh, one verse jumps out at, at us, and so the whole day you should be meditating on it. And if you have been meditating on it, then you can easily memorize it, isn't it? If you'll be thinking through each of the word in in the verse. Uh, then you will be able to memorize it. Okay, I trust some of you are beginning to do that too. Okay, and then of course, uh, reading the Bible also means uh, we want to also do. You know, and the more we do, the more we uh, work work the Bible out in our lives, the more insight we have into in the scriptures. Amen. Okay, then, uh, and so we, we we actually need a teachable spirit because this is a lifetime journey. Then uh, on the third session, we talk about how do we rightly divide the word of God. And we look at uh, 2 Timothy 2.15 and say how we need to uh, be diligent to present ourselves, prove to God a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, and, and, uh, and, and it simply just means that we need to know what it means to divide the old and new covenants. Yeah? And we look at how, if we look at the scriptures from the new covenant perspective, how we can look at Old Testament passages, uh, Gospels, you know, being the transition, and also the, the epistles and so on. Okay, so if you're still not clear about this, please go back and watch the video again. And uh, last week, we looked at the five ways of studying the Bible. We looked at character study, and then uh, we had Bernard to share with us on, uh, on the character roof. Uh, did, did you enjoy that? Huh? It wasn't that very insightful? Okay, so today... Uh, then uh, we also look at what thematic study is all about. And so today, uh, we want to have uh, somebody to share with us a th a th what, she's, what she uh, got out of this thematic study. You know, we say that there are big themes of the Bible. Huh? Uh, and I put down the 16 big themes of the Bible from God all the way to man. And how the central message is God uh, wanting to save man uh, uh, through uh, his son, Jesus Christ. And how these themes all work out through the scriptures. But to, tonight, uh, Hui Shen has uh, worked out something for us. Uh, uh, so I'm going to ask Hui Shen now to uh, come and share with us the work she has done uh, on, on this whole theme of the church. Okay, Hui Shen, over to you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, can, we, can we spotlight Hui Shen? <laughs> uh, here. <laughs> <laughs> so it's good to be able to be here and I'll share what I have uh, um, 
uh, st studied from this uh, thematic study on church. Okay, let me just share my screen. I'll start here. Google presentation. Oops. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Can all of you see my screen? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So, yeah. Uh, so on church. So what have I understood by following through? Um, first of all, it, I've divided into six different uh, sections, if you like. So when you see, this is number one here. So when you see the, the six, then you know it's the end. <laughs> so the first one would be, I follow the four W's are like what, you know, and then the one H, okay? So what is the meaning of church? So from this blue letter Bible, um, we find that the, it is ecclesia, but it's a Greek word. So what does it mean? It's, uh, we, we, we learned uh, from Pastor last week, right? It's uh, how we, we go to this blue letter Bible and we search and we, the word and it will uh, bring out the meaning of it. So it is a compound word, like it's derivative from a Greek and it's calling out. Okay, it's a calling out for what? It's a popular meeting. Usually it's a religious congregation or a Christian community of members. Basically it's an assembly of people. And another more detailed one would be a gathering of the citizens of um, call out from their homes to some public place, uh, an assembly. So it's used among the Greeks, uh, an assembly of people. They convene in a public place. And it's also a place where they discuss things and things concerning uh, each other. Okay. So that tells us what is the meaning of church. It's not a building. We know now it's assembly of people. Now, the second one, the question is where? So where is the church, the word church found in the Bible? Interestingly, when again with the Blue Letter Bible tells us that all these different books, you know, and the word, and you see all these uh, 3, 24, 6, this is the number of times the word church is being uh, mentioned in every one of these books. And it's all in the New Testament. So if you add up all these numbers, Wow, you have 118 times in the Bible and all in the New Testament. So 118 is definitely a very nice number. <laughs> Third one, then ask who. So who started the church and to whom does this church belong? So in Matthew 16, 18, it says, uh, it's written, you know, and I say also unto thee, thou art Peter, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So we know now that who, who's, who said this? Yeah, so Jesus. So who's, the church belongs to who? It actually belongs to Jesus. It's, he started it and Jesus started it and the church is his. Okay. Now the next one we go to will be um, why? why? Why did he have church? You know, And what's the purpose of this assembly? Um, I mean, if you just believe in Jesus, then it's, you have eternal life, so you can stop there, right? But then why did he start this new, uh, this uh, so-called, this assembly of people? Why, why is it important to us? So then uh, just uh, from what I've read through all these different uh, verses to be the word church, I just want to bring out a few uh, principles that I've learned now. So the first one here would be like in Matthew 18, 17, right? It says that, you know, if anyone neglect, if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. Right? If you have any issues in neglect to hear the church, then let it be unto thee a hidden man and a publican. So from here, I think a church is a place where you teach. It's a teaching. Okay. Then praise in Acts 2, 47, it also says it's praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily as should be saved. So I think it's a place where you worship God. And again in Acts, this is he that was in the church, in the wilderness, an angel who speak to him in Mount Sinai and, and with our fathers who received the likely oracles to give unto us. So it's where the word of God is being uh, preached. Then furthermore in Acts, they have churches, throughout Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of your spirit, 
were multiplied. So there are a lot of, there is also evangelism. And finally here, the disciples in, in Acts 11, the disciples were called Christian first in Antioch. So their discipleship. So what's the purpose of this assembly? So to me, I will see that it's a place to teach, worship God, where the word of God is being uh, preached and shared. There's also evangelism and there's also discipleship. Then brings us to the fifth part. Now, how does a church function? What is our identity and what's our culture? Is church uh, just an organization of people, assembly? I think it's, very, it's not only that. So here we say that um, it's, there are elders in every church and they have prayed with fasting. They were commended them to the Lord to whom they believe. So I think it's a God-ordained system and people. And in first, in first Corinthians, unto the church of God, which is in Corinth, to them, they are sanctified in Christ Jesus, and they are called to be saints. And they're all every place upon which the Jesus Christ our Lord both theirs and ours. So assembly, we, we are saints play in church. And in Acts, so were churches established in faith and increased in number daily. So how do we increase? So I think it's exercise of faith, you know. And um, Acts 14, 27, and when they come, they had gathered in church together. They rehearsed all that God has done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. So there are testimonies as well. And Acts 19, 39, but if you inquire anything concerning other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly. So there's also counsel there in church. Moving on, there's the first five, and I've, I've, uh, we have some more to learn about, about church. Give none offense, neither to Jews, nor to Gentiles, nor to the church of God. So there's mutual respect. But if any man may seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither churches of God, neither the churches of God. So therefore, there's mutual respect, there's unity in, in the assembly of God's people. In 1 Corinthians 12, 28, it said, God has set some in church, first apostles, uh, secondary prophets, uh, teachers, uh, gifts of healings, government, diversity of tongues. So all these gifts and talent, what is it for? It's for edification of the assembly of God. In Romans 16, 1, I commend unto you, Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is in Crivia. Uh, so I think uh, it's also a place where we serve and there's service being done, they are being carried out in church. And Romans 16, 16 says, salute one another with the holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. So we can, uh, church is also a holy place. Okay. Finally, application. So do I need to go to church? We may, we may ask ourselves, right? Is, is, that, is that so important? So to me, based on all that I have uh, read, uh, there are a few things that, uh, that came on me as well. Number one, I think it's commanded by God. So uh, why? Because it says in Hebrews as well, let us not give up meeting together as some in habit of doing, but let's encourage one another uh, as you see the day approaching. So uh, God says that we should meet, right? And number two, I think it's also worship. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God for his gracious and the song of praise is fitting. Teaching and learning, okay? Very important. So why? Because you you, you need to um, present yourself, right? To God as one approved by him, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly explaining the word of truth. Finally, is the thing is also a place for fellowship, okay? Because um, we go through challenges, okay, in our life journey and so on. So it's a place where we hope we can comfort one another in our tribulation and we may be able to comfort those who are in trouble as well. That is in 2 Corinthians. So, so from this, I, um, I kind of wrap up to know that, um, yeah, so this is uh, where it is. Um, I think that's about it. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks, everyone. I'll stop share for now. <laughs> thank you for, your, for listening. Thanks, Vishen. That was good. Huh? I think she deserves a big clap from all of us. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Let's just continue. Huh? Um,
Okay, so we, we last week we look at character study, we look at what's thematic study, we also look at uh, a topical study. Yeah? What is a topical study? And uh, so now this evening we're going to ask Shane to share with us. Okay, thank you, Pastor. Um, you want to, you want to share, share screen? Uh? Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is the topical uh, topical study way of uh, reading and studying the Bible. Eh? And a topic we chose uh, that was given to me was baptism. So I um, baptism is very general. So if I was wondering if I wanted to study on baptism, the question I would ask was, is it necessary or do we need to be baptized in the water? baptized in water or in the Holy Spirit. And of course, I started off with the Blue Letter Bible website, uh, key in the synonyms here, baptize, baptizing uh, the various verbs and nouns. So you can see uh, there's a couple of verses here. I start off with Acts 1 verse 5. Acts 1 verse 5, for John baptized with, baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Okay, before I go, the first step is to understand the topic and read the verse around it. So Acts 1 verse 5, I just read. Acts 2 verse 41, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Here, uh, John the Baptist told the people in Matthew 3, verse 11, and in Luke 3, verse 16, that the one who came after him, who is Jesus, would baptize with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And Jesus in Acts 1, verse 5, uh, that's Jesus' word, said the same thing and revealed that the time was near, the time of his crucifixion or his death was near. And therefore, the Holy Spirit came down on Pentecost Day. So I was reading these uh, verses in the, in the said context. The Holy Spirit came down on Pentecost Day. And at least 11 apostles, I believe, were filled with the Holy Spirit. So filled with the Holy Spirit, but the word, of, the word baptized was not used. Baptism of the Holy Spirit was not used. And on that day, 3,000 believers believed they saw this and they were baptized. Uh, I believe they were baptized with water. It would really require a lot of work to baptize 3,000 people. The next one, Acts, the next verse is Acts 19 verse 4. Then said Paul, uh, this was one of the results from the Blue Letter Bible website. John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. So when you read this, I had to read the chapter to understand the context, the verse, uh, where, where this verse was coming from. In chapter 19, there were strife and uh, quarrels or, or there's some contentions between uh, the people of the church. There were disciples of, uh, uh, sorry, I, I, I totally jumped the gun here. My mistake, please uh, ignore that. In chapter 19, actually, sorry, the disciples of Apollos in Ephesus only receive John's baptism, which is the baptism of water, which is of repentance, which was introduced in Matthew 3, verse 11. However, they've never heard of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So when Paul told, he that cometh after me shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, he was surprised that they did not know about this, but he placed his hands on them, baptized them in the name of the Lord Jesus. And these disciples spoke in tongues and prophesied. prophesied. I think about 12 of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And another, uh, there was another uh, verse uh, that has the word baptized in it, which is 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17. If I could read it to you. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach, preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. So I'm trying to differentiate the settings here. 
in this case, as I jumped the gun earlier, in this case, the Corinth church was divided over leaders. A lot of them were arguing that they were following Paul, Apollos, Cephas, or Christ. And then here, Paul was, uh, this chapter, or rather this verse, was in the context that he was saying he did not, he didn't baptize anyone because he didn't want people to think he was baptize, baptizing in his name. It was in the name of Jesus. So that was the context of this verse. So after uh, going through all that, the next step is to put together main ideas. So these are the few questions uh, I put in. Uh, in uh, I, I came up with five points. Uh, you guys might come up with more. First is, uh, logically, is water baptism necessary? Number two, what is the difference between water and Holy Spirit baptism? Third, what are the requirements for water baptism? Of course, what are the requirements for Holy Spirit baptism? And then naturally, is the Holy Spirit baptism necessary? And therefore, I have to draw conclusions. I'm so, I apologize, my slides here is a bit too small. If I could just go through quickly uh, the, the few conclusions I, I came up with. Number one, water baptism is a result, but is a result of, but not a requirement for salvation. And then number two, Paul did not consider water baptism a requirement for salvation. I referred to the verse earlier when there was a, uh, there was some uh, arguments about the church in Ephes the Corinth church in Ephesus. And next one, water baptism is a command of Jesus. In Matthew 28, verse 19, Jesus said, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It is a command of Jesus, but it is error to teach that it is essential to salvation. Like I, in my first point, I said, is a result, but not requirement of salvation. Next, baptism of the Holy Spirit with speaking in tongues is a separate experience from water baptism but they can accompany each other. Next, filling of the Holy Ghost is subsequent to the born again experience. You need to have confessed with your mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in your hearts that Jesus was raised from the dead before you can be saved. So logically, you need to believe and you have, once you have gotten that salvation, you get baptized in water. And once you believe in your heart and uh, that Jesus was raised from the dead, then you can get the Holy. Uh, then you get filled with the Holy Spirit. This is the natural uh, uh, process process of things, progress of stuff. And after that, oops, sorry, it is possible to be saved yet not have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Like the example I showed earlier, uh, Paul uh, Paul discovered some disciple of Apollos who have been baptized in water, but it have not heard of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit baptism is not automatic. We must ask and believe for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. This is in Luke 11 verse 13. And uh, earlier I asked, is, water, uh, is the baptism of the Holy Spirit necessary? And I came up with uh, this result that Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And this is in John 3, verse 5. And lastly, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And this is in Romans 8, verse 8 to 9. So uh, that's all for my sharing. Thank you all for listening. Thanks, Shane. That was great. Huh? Uh, Hi, Shane. So we, we all should give them a big hand. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, so I trust you. You have been encouraged. And uh, that, you know, all of us, all of us can study the Bible. All of us can study for ourselves and, and, and come up with conclusions and learn something from it. And, and uh, it also... That means in future, then it, it, it forms a base, you know, a base, what they call, 
what what you have done, what what both of them have done. Supposing if somebody wants to preach on uh, something about the church, then they can pick up from that that study. Uh, we can do that sort of study and then preach from there or any other passage for that matter. Okay, okay. So uh, let's just try and continue. Uh, okay, so that was Shane. Uh, so now we just to continue. Uh, we also talk about what the word study is. The word study, and as we as, uh, as the, both of them are, have also done, uh, it's not the end in itself, but the means to the end to help us to understand uh, some of the Bible passages that we are going through. Okay. Now, so uh, finally, uh, tonight in the next half an hour or so, I hope we can finish uh, this session on what inductive Bible study is. Okay. Okay, inductive Bible study. What, what is inductive Bible study? What, what's, you know, big word. Huh? So uh, there are two ways of thinking, one deductively and one inductively. And I want to just want to introduce you to them. Huh? Uh, I mean, there, there, there are very uh, technical words to describe it, but I'm trying to put it down to help us to understand. Huh? Um, deductive means you start with the theory. And then you, you make observations to confirm your theory or to modify your theory, and then you draw the conclusions from that. So you say, you start with a theory and you say, all men are mortal. Then you say, Peter is a man. And therefore, uh, Peter is mortal. Uh, so that's what deductive reasoning is about. What about inductive? Inductive, you start, you, you don't, you, 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 inductive, you don't make any conclusions first. You, uh, you don't come up with any theory first. You look at the observations, look at what, what, what is all around. And then you, you do, then you analyze the observation, you classify them, you analyze them and so on. Then you come up with your theory. So you say, uh, my eyes itch badly when I eat prawns. I don't know, but you know, some people I know do. Okay. So you analyze it and say, oh, this, uh, this, this itching of eyes is an allergic symptom. Uh, and therefore, uh, I'm allergic to prawns, right? Okay, so that's that's the process of thinking for inductive thinking. So then you say, okay, but then how do you apply to 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 Bible to, to Bible reading? Okay, so let, let's look at this this passage uh, in Luke eight, uh, uh, which is about Jesus going across the uh, Sea of Galilee with his disciples. He fell asleep, and there was a big storm, and then the disciples woke Jesus up. To say, Master, Master, we are going to drown. And they got out, rebuked the, the wind. Uh, and then the storm subsided and all was calm. Then he asked the disciples, where is your faith? And then they were fearful and yet amazed. And who is he? He commands even the winds and the, and the water and they obey him. So in, in inductive Bible study, then what you do is, what are the observations? What do you see? Okay, there was Jesus was in the boat. He fell asleep. There was a storm, you know. And, and, and so on. So you list down all, all your observations. And then uh, your analysis. So, so what can you learn from this? You know, this is all the time. What we've been doing all the time. Huh? We're just some fancy words. We say inductive. Okay. So at your analysis. So what, what, what can you learn from that? Anybody? Uh, what can you learn from this passage? How do you interpret this passage? You want to put it in the chat if you've got something to say? Anybody? No? Okay, maybe I just, just go on. Huh? So we can say that Jesus has, just like the disciples said, Jesus has authority over the winds and water, right? Uh, that's that's, that's our, uh, our, what they call, interpretation. He has authority. He's a man of authority. Huh? He has authority over this. And then we can, and, and, and we can build on that further. Huh? What sort of authority and so on. So, so that's inductive. Huh? So, but if you're doing a, deductive uh, Bible study, which is in a sense a topical or thematic study. You say, say you want to talk about Jesus' authority uh, during his earthly ministry. Then perhaps this is one of the passages that you will quote and say, okay, Jesus had authority over, over nature. Jesus, when he was on earth, also had authority over uh, diseases that plague mankind. Uh, the blind, he healed the blind. And then you can quote all those things. Uh, and Jesus... Uh, uh, spoke with authority, he taught with authority. You know, so you can quote all those. So, so that, that is your, uh, that, that's the deductive part of it. Huh? Or, or for example, if you want to say, uh, 
what does faith look like? You, know, you want to do a study on then this could be one of the one of the passages that you could do. look at. So where is your faith? You know, because they, they didn't realize the man, the man uh, sleeping there. Uh, if he is, he cannot be drowned. You know, so if he's not going to be drowned, they will not be drowned. So Jesus said, "Where is your faith?" Okay. So 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 roughly that gives you an idea the difference between inductive and deductive. Huh? Uh, we we go into that uh, in a little bit more detail later. Now, uh, so I just want to say the inductive Bible study, and this is something that we, we, we have been doing all along. Even when we say we read the Bible, the same steps are involved. Huh? You observe, you, you interpret, and then you apply. Huh? It's a good way to study a lot, and uh, the Word of God. Why is it good? Because you interpret and study a scripture based on the evidence, on the, on the verses that you have in front of you instead of some preconceived notions of what we want or assume, or assume what the text says, okay? So we observe what the text says before we interpret it and apply it. So inductive Bible study focus on a Bible passage, it, and normally a, a, a bigger passage, huh? a whole chapter or a whole book, uh, and then moves on to these two goals. Uh, so we, we need to discover what the author intended to communicate to their original audience. And then for ourselves, we need to encounter Jesus and then be transformed by his word. Okay, um, I put it down this way. It is more, inductive Bible study is more than, more than a method. Uh, uh, it, it, it is really an attitude. It's attitude to know that hey, we really want to see what the Bible say about these things. Uh, and it's not about, you know, Taking fast food, uh, like we are so used to, oh, somebody give us a verse, we, 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 we memorize this verse and so on. But it's really getting involved in, in, the, in the passage. And so and a lot of times you find that, hey, you don't understand a lot of things, you know. You think you understand it, but you know, there's one part of you don't understand. One, one, you, know, you, you think you, you, you grasp it, but then there are three verses that you cannot explain, you know. And, so, and, and yet it's this whole, whole process of discovering, uh, getting, uh, getting involved in that slowly, slowly, uh, clarity comes, and slowly it comes, you suddenly see it all, all, all put together. Okay, so, uh, and that is also a discovery process. Huh? Uh, it's about having questions, why this way, why you say this, you know, and talking to God about it, Lord, what are you trying to say there? And then finally, discovering God's message for us. So it's also believing that the Bible is worth studying, huh? that people like you and me, ordinary people with God's help, can, can understand and can put it into practice. Amen? Okay, so uh, I want to encourage all of us uh, to, to, con to continue uh, to study, even though you don't understand a lot of the terms around, but somewhere, I think we have enough tools today, more than, you know, because I came from that, that, that era where uh, you need to take, if you want to check on verses, you need to get a big, Bible concordance. And then you want to check the Greek and all this, you need another another uh, strong concordance, you know, and so on and so on. But today, in one simple Bible program, you have everything there, you know. And you will see how many times the word uh, church appears, uh, uh, immediately he can tell you. So today we are, we, we have so many tools that are uh, uh, for us to do this, okay. Now, the other thing we need to note is when we study the Bible, uh, this is it's a big word. Uh, they say hermeneutical. Hermeneutics just means the the the, the art or the, the science of or the way the principle of uh, interpreting the Bible. Okay, so there are three principles, three basic principles that we or, or pillars that we need to always bear in mind. First of all, the Bible is a historical book, uh, spread over thousands of years, uh, two three thousand years by different authors of different backgrounds. You have kings, you have, you know, you have, uh, you have priests, you have different people who wrote the Bible, okay? Uh, prophets and so on and so on. Huh? Uh, uh, then they are written in different cultures. Uh, we, we went through the book of Daniel, you know that how we, it was also uh, a different culture altogether uh, that Daniel was written. And then it was in Hebrew, um, the Old Testament basically in Hebrew, the New Testament in Greek. And, and part of Daniel, as we, as we discussed, too, was in Aramaic. Huh? Okay? So the Bible is a historical book, and we always must bear that in mind. Huh? And then the Bible contains uh, uh, different literary uh, 
I always got I this French word, I don't know how to pronounce genre or something like that. Huh? Uh, so the different types of literature that the history, the prophecy, the letters, poetry, and so on. So and 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 we are doing prose, uh, probes also uh, Jewish poetry in a different way. And so we need to understand, uh, we read and understand that what sort of genre is which, uh, which in turn affects how we interpret it. Okay. You follow me so far. <laughs> And then finally, we must understand that the Bible is a revelation of God and His plan for us. That His plan is worked out through Jesus. And hence, in our reading and studying the Bible, we need to see Jesus and His role in God's plan. Amen? So far, so good, huh? Okay, so what is inductive Bible study? It's, it's a big word for what we've been doing all along. First of all, observation. Uh, we need to know what the Bible says, the passage says, interpretation, uh, how... What does, what does it mean, uh, this passage? And then finally, how do we apply this passage? Okay, uh, Say, Pastor, you tell us big story only for simple things. But sometimes simple principles are need to be repeated so that we, we, we get, you know, it become part of our system. You read any Bible passage, then you begin to do the same thing again and again. Okay, But I, want, I just want to go a little bit more detail. What's observation? You need to observe. You need to ask questions. You need to find keywords. You need to observe the literary features, you know. Uh, you need to also compare Bible versions, for example, and then analyze the structure. Okay, let's just quickly go through. Huh? So ask questions of what? Ask questions of content, you know. Uh, we need to understand the substance of the text uh, and the significance of the content. So the normal questions we ask, who, what, where, when, and so on. Uh, and and we, see, we see how we can use those same four Ws for for almost anything we want to study, okay? And then we need to understand the relationships uh, with the words, phrases, concepts, and, and between the literary units, between the different paragraphs. And today it's easier because uh, the Bible, they, we, the, all, all our translations divide the Bible into paragraphs, which makes it easier for us to grasp. Uh. But there are also relationships of words and so on. Uh. And then we need to also understand the context, uh, uh, from the, how it relates to, the, to, the, to what was before and what was what, what was after, uh, like what um, what Shane tried to do for us uh, just now. Huh? So the, also the intention, we need also to discover what's the author intention. I mean, each of them wrote for a purpose. Uh, so we need to un, un, uh, discover what's, what's the only, why, why did he say this? Because there's always a reason. Why did the author say, say what he said? Why didn't he say this? Make it so clear for why didn't he edit? Sometimes I ask him, why didn't he just say it? I don't need to crack my head and think for so long, you know, and, and, and still maybe still don't get the right answer. Uh, so 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 there we, there's always a reason why he didn't say it, uh, how he said it, huh? And and then that will then lead us to the uh to the why questions. Huh? Uh, later on we shall talk about then the implication. Okay, then we need to when we do uh interpretations, huh? then we need to understand uh, this the the this uh, sorry when we do interpretation we need to understand the, the the implications of what we interpret you know so sometimes if you uh, you interpret in a different way it goes all over the place so so like in a sense uh, uh what what um what what we shared shared with us why do we need to worship why do we need to come to church well, because if we come, need to come together to worship together, you know, and that's what the scripture tells us. Well, like in Shane's case, he didn't just say that, oh, uh, and he, he he makes it very clear that uh, salvation, so that it falls in line with what we know about, what, what we know throughout the whole Bible about salvation. Uh, baptism is not necessary, not a requirement for salvation, but it's a result of salvation, right? So, so that helps us. Uh, so we need, when sometimes you just take, some people just take one, two verses and don't see it as a whole, then when your interpretation comes, it, it goes haywire. Huh? Uh, so, um, and so on. Huh? So, so, yeah, I sort of answered some of those questions. Okay, so what inferences can be based on what's happening in text and what can a given interpretation impact the rest of scripture or the other way around? What, how does the rest of scripture influence our interpretation? Okay, so we need to ask questions all the time we read when we read the Bible. Huh? Content or relationship, intent and implication. Okay, so then we also need to look for words that convey meaning that will help us interpret the text. For example, we need to look for words of significance. Now, we, we, we were looking at this verse three, two weeks ago. Huh? 
diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So the word rightly dividing becomes a word of significance. Because the rest we can understand, but what does it mean to rightly divide? So we, we, we need to dwell into that word a little bit more to help us understand that what, what uh, Paul was saying uh, to Timothy here. You follow me? Okay, so uh, then there could be repeated words or synonyms. Uh, so, and sometimes uh, we need to watch for this also. Huh? For example, in Proverbs, uh, you realize that to emphasize something, it says, says it again in different ways and says it again uh, and, and goes on again. Huh? Okay, so thus you will walk in the ways of the good and keep to the paths of the righteous. So the ways and paths are synonyms, uh, good and righteous, you know, so the good are the righteous, or the righteous are the good. Now, what else can you see here in the next two verses? Anybody? You know, put it in the chat somewhere, or show it out. No. Okay. 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 I, I just carry on. Huh? I'm running out of time. <laughs> For the upright will live in the land and the blameless will remain in it. So the upright and blameless are the same words, you know, to help us understand a bit more. Huh? And then, but the wicked will be cut off from the land and the unfaithful will be torn from it. So wicked, unfaithful. You got to think, you know, wicked in what sense? Unfaithful in what sense? Huh? Right? And then uh, see, and then if you want to you're curious, a bit more curious, say, hey, both of it, one live in the land, one cut off from What does it mean? Yeah. So, so you, I'm not, you, when you find words like this, you ask questions and it helps you to understand. Huh? Okay, but let's move on. Some words have bigger meaning, uh, theological, I call it theological significance. Say, for example, it look like uh, simple words like uh, Romans 1.17. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. You know, for many, many years, I never understood the word righteousness. Yeah, uh, until suddenly all click and then it comes. It, 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 you know, now, now we, we, you know, all the time we've been taught, oh, you, to be righteous means you must do this, you must do that. But now suddenly uh, it, it just, it, it's the righteousness that is imputed to me by the, because of what Jesus has done on the cross. And, and so you, we need to look for some of these words, uh, 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 what they call theolo of great theological significance. Uh, places and our things, you know, Sometimes you read, okay, when you are just reading the Bible for reading the Bible's sake, then maybe if you don't know, never mind. Huh? But when you read a verse like this, while well, Gal Galileo was pro council Achaia and the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. So, so, but if you are doing a study, a serious study, then you need to know what is, where is Achaia, where is Corinth? Huh? Corinth is in the province of Kaya. <laughs> yeah. So if you don't know, then you don't hear yeah, oh, what is it, two different places, and what is a pro council and so on, okay? Then you need to, uh, the, in the Bible, there are a lot of symbols and a lot of figures of speech. Yeah? And so, uh, like, for example, the Lord told, told uh, Noah, I set my rainbow. It's a symbol. So, every, so that's why people say rainbow is a sign of counter. Where did you get it from? From Genesis nine, huh? so the, in the in the Bible there are many many of these symbols and many many, many of these figures of speech that we need to understand and get used to. Okay, okay. Uh, th so those are keywords. Then some literary features are uh, uh, repetition. We talk about repetition of words and so on, and also of ideas already. Uh, then there are conjunctions. You know what conjunctions are? Uh, this this is an English lesson. Okay, very quickly. All these words are for and no, but or yet and so, or what you call conjunctions. When you see words like this, you know, uh, so and so, but for this, uh, but for uh, the Lord's grace, he will not be this. Then, then you got to understand what he means, you know. So when you see conjunctions, actually you should stop and ask, uh, or the other, another set of conjunctions will be either or, neither nor, not only, but also these sort of conjunctions. Every time you see this conjunction in the text somewhere, Let's stop and ask why. So, what exactly is the author saying? Okay, and because since as although uh, though while and whereas, so so things like this, you know, uh, say though you speak with 
uh, tongues as angels and all, but you do not have love, you are like empty gong, uh, empty sounding gong. So, do, you know, so the word, all these conjunctions are important to help you to understand the, the passage. Amen? Okay, so uh, there's also comparison. Uh, you, it happens always in the scriptures, comparison and contrast. And then there's also idioms, huh? uh, similes, metaphors. Uh, what is a simile? Uh, suddenly, I can't uh, Anyway, uh, simile is... Give me an example of simile. Anybody? <laughs> okay, maybe metaphor easier. You know, say the Lord... You tell the Lord, say, I'm your shield and your exceeding great. Well, it's a metaphor to say shield is a protection. Hyperbole, uh, hyperbole is, um, you know, sometimes I'm like, what? Last Sunday's sermon, is it? Um, you must hate your, uh, if you do not, uh, if you do not love me, what, what is it? If you, got to, you have to hate your parents, da, 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 and all this, huh? you know, uh, so that you can, then otherwise you cannot be my disciple. What Jesus is trying to say, is, he's exaggerating and saying, you, you got to love me so much as though he's hating. You understand? And the irony is like um, saying something that you, you okay, maybe another time, huh? I'm, I'm trying to rush to reality. <laughs> okay, uh, then, when you read, you also need to look out for list of items. Yeah? Um, for example, in this in this verse that we've been looking at, so can you see a list of items there? And, and it's important every time you see a list, then you, you need to you know, sit down and, and, and think about it, you know, because why would the Bible give you a Holy Spirit inspire Paul to write a whole list? Say all scripture is God brief and it's useful for it. Teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training. Training what in righteousness. So when you have a list like this, then you need to then look at this list and see, hey, what does it mean? You know, what does all these words mean? Huh? So the, 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 in different different passages, you always have many lists. Huh? And so every time you come to a list, uh, look at them, write it down, you know, then uh, and then uh, finally, there's also a tone of writing. Some, 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 some in some scriptures, it is very hard, you know, harsh. The, the prophets are very harsh. Uh, some, some are very you know, softer and so on. So we need to look for some of these. Huh? Okay, then we, the other thing that we need to do is to compare uh, Bible version and help you to understand as well. You say, for example, NKJV, which is a very, we say the King James and New King James is actually a very uh, almost a literal translation, a word for word translation almost. Huh? And so, but when the New new Living Translation, is, which is like a paraphrase, you know, to make it easier to understand. But sometimes you can see through this, huh? sometimes you can help you to understand, but at the same time, if you just use a, a paraphrase, then you, you lose some of the accuracy of the words there. Huh? Uh, just putting down some of this for you to, to see. Uh, the Good News Bible is also uh, do your best to be full approval in God's sight as a worker who is not ashamed and of his work who correctly teaches the message of God's truth. Uh, uh, a little bit different, uh, teaching the message of God's truth, uh, a little bit different from rightly dividing the word. Uh, uh, but we won't go into the details now. But just to, to show you different versions, but it also helps you to understand more, uh, uh, a little bit more. Uh, Okay, so we need to analyze the structure, uh, <clears throat> recognize the genre and key elements. What are key elements that break out the text? Boundaries, are, uh, cohesion between the units. Is the text structure to convey, convey a message? You know, okay, this is when you look at the big picture. Uh, for example, uh, um, okay, I think most of you would have done Mark 7 already uh, in, your, in your CG by now. Mark 7. Can you remember what Mark 7 was all about? Uh, it's about Jesus, uh, the, the Pharisees coming and asking uh, to, from Jerusalem, coming to where, uh, uh, where Jesus was, and then say, started asking him questions. And then why your disciples don't wash hands? Why they don't do this? Uh, they're unclean and all this. And Jesus telling them, you know, it's not what 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 you take in that makes you unclean, is but what, what comes out of your heart and mouth that makes you unclean, right? Uh, the part. And then uh, then Jesus then went on to Tyre, which is another, which is a which, which is a Gentile 
Gentile town. And then there was this uh, woman with a uh, daughter with an unclean spirit that Jesus drew. Uh, she begged Jesus uh, uh, to, to, do, to, to dr- uh, deliver the daughter. But Jesus said, you know, uh, I got to give food to the children first, not to dogs. You cannot know, waste it on dogs. They say even dogs uh, eat the crumbs under the table, you know. And then the, because of her faith, she, the, the, the daughter was delivered. And then Jesus went to uh, Decapolis, another Gentile area. And then people came to him and he healed a, a, a deaf and dumb, uh, a mute, a deaf and dumb, and, and in a very spectacular way. Uh, uh, and so, 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 when, so, why am I saying this? So, some of what I'm trying to say here, so you see that this, when you look at a passage like Mark 7, then to me, I saw it as breaking, it being broken up in three parts. Jesus, you know, the, the, the Pharisees attacking Jesus on uh, the, uh, the, the disciples being unclean in the sense of in the habits, or uh, unclean in accordance to the, to, the, to the Jewish customs. And then Jesus saying, there's no what they do that makes you unclean. It's what comes out of your heart that makes you unclean. And then Jesus, like almost intentionally going, went to two, two groups of people which were supposed to be unclean and then did something miraculous there in both, both of these places. And so, so we, when we look at a big passage like this, then we need to see the different how it fits in together. Uh, uh. Okay, uh, let's move on. Uh. So now we go into interpretation. So we need to consider context. Every time we say that again and again, we need to consider context, the historical context, the, the, the literature, literary part of it, and the biblical theme that, 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 that comes through it all. Uh. Yes. And we need to always to compare scripture with scripture uh, because scripture always inter- interprets scripture. Uh. Uh, better than any anyone of us can, better than any scholar. Okay, and then we, when we when necessary, we do some word study to help us understand. Uh, uh, so the purpose is to find out what I put down what the word could mean, so that we can then place them back in its context to find out what it does mean, what the, what it does mean in in the in the passage. And I did, I think the last last. Yeah, last week we I did one one on the word study and show you know, how sometimes simple words you think you know but actually when you check the Greek then it, it, it shows up so much more for us okay and then the some and when we do inductive Bible study it also means that we also sometimes need to go and do uh, if a certain topic comes up within there then what is clean and clean in the, according to Jewish custom we can do a, we can do a topical study on that too right? And, and then we, we need to compare, you know, the whole of Scripture teach to uh, uh, compare what we have done to, against what the whole of Scripture teach. Okay? And then we need to counter check with other sources, sometimes uh, helpful, sometimes to check with some other commentaries. But, uh, but just be aware, most other sources uh, may not have a new covenant view. Huh? Many, many, many of these uh, uh, sources that we, we refer to may be mixed, you know, and they say, oh, yeah, but they talk about grace. Yeah, but, you know, grace, grace, they talk about grace as a topic. We talk about grace as a whole gospel. Yeah, I hope you know the, the difference. Huh? And, and that, that should give us a different view of scriptures. Okay. So interpretation, I think we are, we are all getting there. The more we do it, the more we know how to interpret. But if you don't do your, your serious study yourself, you just pick up here and there, then, then you don't know it. But the more, the more you study, the more you put yourself in, into the word, then the more, the more, more accurate your interpretation are, the more sharp your inter- interpretations are. Amen. Okay. Finally, application. Uh, uh, we need to establish the relevance uh, uh, and then appropriate the meaning. Uh. Relevance meaning we need to know the author's in, original intention and application for original uh, audience, and then the underlying principle of the, the text application, applying the text for today. Okay? And then finally, uh, how do we appropriate the meaning? We, we need to ask ourselves, if this talks about this, uh, uh, then what, what can Jesus do for, 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 for me? Or what, what, what is Jesus doing for me? You know? And then we need to thank Jesus for what he has done and what he continues to do for us in that particular area. Okay? 
Okay, so uh, inductive Bible study is, is something that we should be doing all the time. Huh? Uh, observation, interpretation, what does it mean for me? And then what does it mean? And then finally, what does it mean for me? Uh, the, applying the passage. Okay, uh, we crossed the time by two minutes, I'm sorry. Uh, but I'm going to stop here now. Uh, now, just, just to say huh, uh, that we, we have gone through a lot of, a lot of, words a lot of uh, things over the last five weeks um, but I trust that it will, it will help some of us or many of us uh, to begin to read the Bible for ourselves okay and to begin to chew the Bible for ourselves and begin to you know so to say hey sometimes I would just want to do one or two of these studies uh, a little bit more seriously and you you know the tools that are available for us too huh? and so I, I trust I trust that we, we we as a church as a people will begin to be People, uh, people grounded in the word of God and, and, and knowing that because the word of God, the written word of God points to the word always. Amen. Okay. Lord bless you. I trust that you have a great time, a great journey ahead, uh, reading and studying the Bible by yourself. Amen. Pass back Thank to Susan. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Peter. I'm sure that we all uh, learned a lot tonight, right? Uh, I know it's a lot to take in, uh, but this was recorded. And so we will be putting it back up, go through it again. And, and I, do, I do believe that after these five sessions, uh, many more of us will be inspired to read and to study the Bible ourselves. Uh, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be looking forward to all of the testimonies and all of the great things that you learn uh, in the future. So do remember tonight that as we leave the meeting tonight in a few more moments to uh, send a message over to the TNCC uh, gel and webinar uh, phone number uh, to make sure that you sign up for next week. So make sure you don't miss out on the link uh, that will be sent out for next week's uh, four week series starting up next week on God wants you well. Okay, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but I think tonight, um, before we, we split ways, just like to appreciate Pastor Peter who put this five week series together. Okay, so for him, uh, he didn't just study the Bible himself, but he has to think about how to teach us to study the Bible. And so, and so this five week series, there's been a lot and I think it's been a great uh, individual study that we can go through and you can send to many people uh, and to uh, inspire them and to help them how to properly study the Bible. So can we just put our hands together and just really thank Pastor Peter uh, for the last five weeks. Uh, you can unmute yourself as well uh, and shout out your thanks. Uh, and then we'll see you. I have no idea. I, I, I have no idea who you are talking to, man. Because I heard an echo. I thought you were talking. I thought it was voice call. I mean, team chat. Okay, thanks, everyone. Okay, <laughs> bye. Thank you. Okay, once Pasta. again, thanks. Thanks, right, good night. thanks Shane. Thank, thank you, Pastor. Shane. Good night. Thank you so much, and Pasta, then everybody. Bye. And all those who have participated, I trust you have thank also you. enjoyed good yourselves. Night. Okay. Hello, thank you. Thank, you, thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Hallelujah. Shalom. Thank you, Pastor. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Pastor, good night. Good night.